thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here today. I know you've got a great lineup of speakers and I'm really looking forward to getting into options basics. I myself come from the trading floors uh, in Chicago and New York where I was a market maker for many years, traded independently, uh, now for the past six years, just teaching options. That's all I do are these presentations, teaching all sorts of options concepts. Really looking forward to getting into the basics with you today. Uh, here is our disclaimer, options are not suitable for everyone. They are rather complex investment tools that do need to be well understood before using them in a live account. I wanted to take a minute uh, first to look at options volume just over the years from a broad uh, perspective. You see the increase in volume that you've seen in the product uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, this uh, spike in 2011 came from the, uh, the year of the European sovereign debt crisis. Some of you may have been trading that year. Uh, and then we had some uh, tailing off uh, in, in very low volatility years between 12 and 17 before setting some records as volatility came back into the market in 2018 and 19. I'm bringing this slide up because we're looking at numbers in 2020. Richard already outlined how much more volume we're seeing this year. And in 2020, if we keep up this pace, and this is data from OCC, if we keep up this pace in 2020, we're going to be up around 7 billion contracts just uh, destroying all records in the past. So more and more people are using options. Uh, we know what's going on in the world. It's not all uh, a reason to celebrate, uh, but it is a reason to reflect on the product and recognize that when the markets are volatile, when investors are stressed, they continue to turn to the options product. And as we walk through the sessions today, I think you'll see why investors are finding that use from the options product. Here's the outline for today. We'll start with just defining options from a broad perspective. Uh, we'll look at calls and puts uh, from both the buy and sell side and a little bit on options pricing before looking at account balances and what you would see in your account as you're buying or selling an option. I'll walk through an example of each of those. Let's take a step back before we define the options contract. You know, prior to exchanges and standardized contracts, uh, options had always been used. And, uh, but before you had that, that listed product, they were used in what would be considered an over-the-counter fashion. And what that means is a buyer would contact their broker and, and say what they wanted to do with respect to their options trade. And uh, the broker would get on the phone and, and try to find a counterparty. And when they would do that, those buyers and sellers after an execution were tied together. And you had this different dynamic than you have today where buyers and sellers prior to exchanges um, didn't have that, that clearing aspect or that fungible aspect. It wasn't until you had exchanges and listed products with standardized terms uh, that investors were then allowed to just go to the open market and buy or sell from any counterparty and then close that position on any exchange against any other counterparty. And that's what really makes the industry function. So let's look at what buyers and sellers are doing, uh, options contracts give buyers the right, buyers pay money up front, it's an immediate debit, and they have the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock. That's what buyer sell an underlying asset is. The buyer pays for the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock. Sellers of options are paid up front and they take on the obligation to execute a transaction in shares of stock. Uh, that, that transaction on the seller side is gonna be the opposite transaction that the buyer has the right to. And we're gonna dig into a little bit more detail here in a second. The key takeaway is buyer versus seller, rights versus obligations. The price at which this transaction can take place and the expiration date or how long does the buyer have the right and the seller have the obligation, those details are going to be defined in the options contract within what we call contract terms, standardized terms. Of course, the underlying stock, the symbol that we're looking at is going to be identified. The unit of trade is very important to understand for standardized options. This is the deliverable or how many shares trade uh, change hands if the, uh, if the buyer or the seller needs to execute this transaction. It's 100 shares for a standard contract. 
uh, the, the option will actually be quoted on a per share basis. So when you look at option premium, and I'll get a little more into option premium later, uh, when you look at option premium uh, quoted on a per share basis, you have to multiply that by 100, and then you will get the, the total premium amount, dollar amount that will change hands. The strike price will be identified. This is the, the price at which the buyer has the right to either buy or sell shares and the seller has the obligation to take that other side. And then the expiration month will also uh, be identified. When you look at options as a tool overall, uh, there's a lot of reasons why investors turn to the options product. Certainly reducing risk, income generation. These are somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, related and, and combined. A lot of strategies uh, accomplish both of these things. Acquiring stock, leverage, speculation. There's a lot of reasons why you can get into the options product, all centering around flexibility. Whether you have a bullish, bearish, or neutral outlook, if you think volatility is going high or volatility is going low, there is an option strategy for you that allows the investor to get into more trades and allows you to capitalize on uh, more market opinions that you might have. If you're just trading stock, you don't have as many choices. I've mentioned this stock transaction a few times. Buyers pay for rights and sellers uh, take on obligations. Um, so are you going to be buying or selling the stock? That's one of the first questions we're going to outline as we get into call at calls and puts. I'm going to define each of those for, with a little bit uh, from the buy or sell side. You want to stay tuned for sure. Session two, Tony Zhang is going to be talking about buying versus selling in much more detail. Well, here I'm just going to outline what are calls and puts and just take a brief look uh, from the buy or sell side, what each of those means, starting with call options. An equity call buyer has paid money up front and now owns the right to buy shares of stock at the strike price uh, by the, or up to and including the expiration date. A little bit of terminology here. Uh, option buyers are also called option holders and are known as being long the contract. And I'll stop there for just a second. Most investors are familiar with the terms long and short, meaning market direction. If you're long, you're bullish. And if you're short, you're bearish. And that is the most common way to uh, identify those terms. In the options space, there's another definition. Long just simply means you're long the contract. You've bought it. You own it. It has nothing to do with market direction. And short, or if you're a seller, you're short the contract. And that's what we'll see here. An equity call seller has, paid, or has been paid cash uh, immediately goes into their accounts, cash credit, non-refundable, and the call seller has taken on the obligation to sell shares of stock, also known as the writer, and is short the contract. In this, uh, in this case, short does not necessarily mean they have a bearish outlook. It's just that they're short the contract. It doesn't have uh, a specific reference to market direction. So you have call buyers and call sellers. Well, what motivation would you have? What are you trying to capitalize uh, whether you're on the, the buy side here or the sell side. Let's take a look at each of these. First, from the call buying side, uh, just looking at an example. Uh, here's your, your, uh, your option, the, the 60 strike price call trading for $3. Uh, remember, this is on a per share basis. If you bought this option, you pay $300 up front. That becomes your maximum loss. That's the most you can lose is what you pay for it. And now, you know, here you have the dashed line. This is where the, the stock would be if you bought shares at 60. You have your clean break even from 60 going up or down, but a lot of risk and a lot of capital laid out up front. If you bought the options contract, you would be $300 maximum loss. And you'd have to recover that $300 before you started to make money. Now, re remember all of these P&L graphs are drawn as if you were at expiration. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, prior to expiration, uh, options are going to be priced with an element of volatility. And again, we'll see that a little bit later in this session. Uh, but you don't know what volatility is going to be with one, two, or three weeks to go. Uh, that makes drawing these P&L graphs imprecise because you don't know what that value will be if there's life left in the option contract. Certainly, you might be looking to sell this call before you get to expiration. 
And if the stock uh, were, to, were to rally to 61 or 62 right away, you might sell it for a profit uh, very quickly. But at expiration, here's what you're looking at. It's a bullish strategy, of course, because you want the stock price to go higher. That is going to drive uh, the value of your option higher. It's not easy to make money buying options. I'll say that right up front. Uh, you do have to pick your moments. You have to be right on timing and direction and magnitude, and you have to overcome uh, that time decay. Uh, which uh, which is going to affect you every day, and uh, come expiration there will be no uh, no time value left uh, in the option. And from the sell side, undoubtedly, if you're selling a call option, you already own the shares. That's what I'll look at here. I'm not going to walk through this too much. Uh, Jason uh, Ayers is going to cover the, this strategy, the covered call, in great detail today in session three. Uh, but very popular strategy, um, uh, one of the most popular strategies used by investors. Uh, here you own shares of stock and you sell a call option to receive premium. This is known as the income generation part. You're paid $175 in this example and now have taken on the obligation to sell the shares that you own at the strike price of 55. If the stock rallies, you're obligated to sell your shares here and can't make any more money and you're paid upfront to do that. So if the stock doesn't rally, if it consolidates or if it sells off, uh, then you have an opportunity to use this option premium to your advantage. It lowers your break-even point and you get some nice advantages here. A break-even point drops by the premium amount that you received. Uh, your maximum profit is easily calculated by the strike price at which you might have to sell your shares. Um, and you, have to, you keep your option premium, that's not gonna go away, minus your entry point. That's how you do those calculations. But again, session three, get into this strategy in, in great detail. Uh, it's often the strategy they, that investors start with when they get into uh, options. Let's look at put options now. Uh, we've covered calls. So uh, the put option, from an equity put buyer's perspective, they buy, pay for the right to sell underlying shares of stock. They are long the contract. In this regard, not, not necessarily bearish, but long the contract and own the right to sell shares of stock. An equity put seller has been paid, they sold an option, they're paid up front, cash goes into their account, and now they have the obligation to buy shares of stock. They are the writer and they are short the contract. They've sold a put, so they are short the contract. And what about motivations behind these? I'm gonna look at the put buyer motivation from a two, uh, from two different perspectives. Uh, first of all, from the speculating perspective. Again, it's hard to make money this way. It really is. You have to be right on the way, uh, the direction the, the stock is going, uh, the magnitude that it moves there, and, and the timing at which it gets there. But if you do want to speculate and take advantage of, of leverage and see if you can get a big move in your direction, here you have the stock trading 36. Most investors are not going to short shares of stock. Uh, so with the stock trading at 36, instead of doing that, you buy a 35 strike put option. Uh, that gives you the right to sell shares at 35 as the stock drops lower and lower. The right to sell shares at 35 gains and gains value. And that's how you're trying to profit off this trade. Whenever and wherever you sell this option, you have to recover your 225. At expiration, you would need the stock uh, at least down to 32 and three quarters uh, below that level you can profit. Again, if it moves quickly before then, this option certainly might be trading for more than two and a quarter. If the stock moves down to 34, $33 right away, you'll, you'll likely have an opportunity to sell that for profit. That's speculating uh, with calls. Uh, now looking at, or sorry, speculating with puts. Now let's look at buying puts as a hedge. Uh, this would be uh, you know, probably the more common way puts are used as the protective put. You own shares of stock and you're bullish, but you're concerned about the downside. This is the classic form of buying puts or buying insurance on your portfolio. In this case, buying a 60-day 40-strike put to protect your investment where you bought shares at 42. So your long shares at 42 you pay $155 for the right to sell shares at 40. And that's the worst it can get. If the stock drops down to 40, 
you own the right to sell shares. The stock can go to zero and you own the right to, to sell your shares at 40. That protects your losses. It's just like buying insurance. You have your deductible of $2. You give that up before your strike price kicks in and then your insurance is effective at that point and below and you've paid your premium for this insurance policy. There's all sorts of different strikes you can choose, different expirations that you can choose, and that'll all affect your premium. Uh, remember, if you're buying uh, puts as protection over and over again, options expire, and you have to keep that in mind. Uh, investors may continue to hold puts and hold insurance on their portfolios as a, a regular position management technique, or they may uh, be timely and choosy with when they do that. Um, uh, sell stops don't always work as they will get you out of a position during a flash crash and you won't be able to uh, capitalize on a quick bounce. They don't work during after hours activity or weekends. Uh, so there's some differences between uh, puts and stop losses. And this is the way options can be used uh, to hedge your portfolio. And now looking at selling puts, this is the fourth side. We've done buying calls and selling calls, just did buying puts. Now looking at selling puts here in the cash secured form, this is the objective of, uh, of buying shares of stock, but instead of just going right out and getting shares where they're trading today, selling a put option and receiving premium up front. Now, if you're assigned on a put, remember what it means to sell a put option, you're paid up front and you're obligated to buy shares at the strike price. Well, you may want to do that. If the, if the shares are trading up in the mid 80s and you're not comfortable with that price, you might sell an 80 strike put, go out a few months, receive 390 in premium for it. And if the stock rallies, well, you kept your $390. If the stock drops, then you will be assigned and buy shares where you want them. Uh, and in this case, uh, your, your strike price minus the premium received would actually be your cost basis, this is where you would be long the shares from uh, 7610. Ideally, you might have the stock drop just below your strike and you're, you're assigned, you get shares and you have your break even point below where they're currently trading. That would be ideal. It uh, doesn't happen too often, but this is the way to use uh, selling puts uh, to, to possibly get into a stock position. Again, much more on, on buying versus selling and the dynamics and nuances uh, that Tony's going to discuss uh, up next. I want to talk a little bit about option premium uh, so investors understand where that all comes from. And the first thing I need to do is define moneyness of options and what that all, uh, what the term means, what we're trying to do with moneyness and then, and then premium. For call options, really the same definition for calls and puts. I'm going to start with calls. Uh, an option is in the money if the option owner has the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock at a better price than is currently available in the open market. For calls, in the money options are at strike prices below where the, where the stock currently is. If you own the 40 call, you have the right to buy shares at 40. That's better than 50. It's in the money. You can then further calculate how much is it in the money. It's in the money by $10. You already own the right to buy at 40, stocks at 50. That's $10 of, of value you would expect to pay if you were going to buy this option, or at least $10 you would expect to receive to sell this option. In the money options for calls, strikes below where the stock is currently trading. And then out of the money, just on the other side real quick, out of the money is the opposite. If you own a call option at a worse price uh, than where the stock currently is, in this case, if you own the right to buy shares at 60 and the stock's currently at 50, well, there's no inherent value there. You, you own the right to buy shares above where you can just get them in the open market. So any value here is going to be paying for the potential that the stock goes up and these 60 strike or these 55 strike uh, options become worth something. At the money is simply when those numbers equate each other. Now in reality, in practice, at the money is a little more vague than that. As an educator, I state them as exactly equal to each other when 50 equals 50. Uh, but in practice, you may hear investors uh, refer to a range of strike prices. They may look at the 45 or even the 55s, real close to 50, and call those the at the money options because they're near 
at the money. That's how it might, uh, you might hear it referred to in practice. Same definition for puts, uh, just from the opposite perspective. So I'll walk through it again. Uh, if you own a put option and you have the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock better than the open market, then the option is in the money. Uh, puts give the owners uh, the right to sell shares of stock. So puts are in the money when the strike price is above the current stock level. The owner of the April 60 put has the right to sell shares at 60. If the stock's trading at 50, that's $10 in the money. You would expect to pay at least $10 for that option plus more for the potential that the option uh, gains even more value. Out of the money options for puts are with strike prices below where the stock is. The owner of the 40 put has the right to sell shares at 40. The stock's up at 50. There's no inherent value there. So any value in the 40 put is just gonna be the potential for time and movement in the uh, stock price to give value to those options. And we're gonna use these definitions as we look at the different pieces of option premium in its most simple form. Option premium is a combination of two pieces, the intrinsic value and time value. There may or may not be intrinsic value in the options contract. Uh, intrinsic is the in the money amount. We just walked through that definition and how to calculate it. Intrinsic value is the in the, in the money amount, if any. So your first decision, the first uh, analysis you're doing is, What's the moneyness of the option that you're looking at? Is it in the money or not? If it is, the quick arithmetic will tell you how much intrinsic value there is. If the option is not in the money, if it's at the money or out of the money, then intrinsic value is going to be zero. There is no inherent value. All that is left is time value. Time value expressed as all of the premium amount in excess of the intrinsic value, which might be zero. This time value is what decays as expiration approaches. When you get to expiration day, when an option expires, it is only worth its intrinsic value. There's no more time left for the stock to move. There's no more time for volatility to have an effect on the value of this options contract. With no more time left, only intrinsic value remains. Buyers and sellers need to be aware of this. When you are selling an options contract, you are likely trying to capture time decay. And in order to, to, uh, to determine how much you're trying to capture, you'll need to do this calculation. Certainly with out of the money options, it's very simple. It's very easy because there's no intrinsic value, everything you see is time value. But if you're going to sell an option that's in the money, you will want to uh, calculate the difference and, and see how much of this value is intrinsic and then how much of it is time. And if I'm selling this option, I am trying to capture that time value. Uh, the intrinsic value is going to fluctuate with the stock price. I'm gonna show this uh, graphically, I think a nice representation of the totality of option premium here is to look at those two pieces uh, separately. Intrinsic value is sensitive to stock price movements relative to the strike price. If you sell an in the money option, the intrinsic value might work in your favor if the stock moves opposite the strike price. You could sell an option attempting to capture some of that decrease in intrinsic value, um, but that perspective would have a directional bias. Uh, the key point is that intrinsic value is sensitive to stock price movements, not time decay. On the other side, time value, that's what decays every day, uh, represented by a number some of you may be familiar with called theta. Time value will decay over time. It is also affected by volatility. So whereas each passing day would erode the value of the option, changes in volatility might have the opposite effect. Volatility can go up or down. 
So you have these different factors that may or may not be working in the same direction. The passage of time doesn't necessarily mean that time value goes down because what if volatility goes higher? You can have that dynamic as well. And then other elements to time value that don't change as frequently are interest rates and dividends. They all play a role in what time value is. Uh, but the two pieces that, that most get most of the focus as they're changing are time, uh, days to expiration and volatility. Um, if you're trying to forecast what an option might be worth, given a certain stock price, given a day into the future, given a certain volatility rate, that's when options calculators become very valuable. Uh, investors often ask me, hey, if this, if this stock moves to this certain price and there's two weeks left, what's the option going to be worth? And as I said earlier, you can't draw that P&L graph because you don't know what volatility is going to be. But if you have a calculator in front of you, put in a stock price, change the days to expiration to represent how far you think the stock is going to take to get there, assume a volatility rate, you'll need some reference point to input a volatility rate, and then calculate and see what the option would be worth. Hopefully you already know the risk-free rate of interest, by the way, that would be the risk-free rate of return on, on cash between today and expiration date, or as close to that you can get and dividends if this stock pays one. Put in all of those things and calculate to estimate what the option might be worth uh, if the stock moves and there's still some time left. Now, the last thing I wanna walk through today is what happens in your account. Uh, if you're trading options, well, even if you're an experienced uh, trader with options, it's, it surprises me sometimes. Investors often look at the positions they have in their account and their overall account balances, but not necessarily uh, check the balances in each segment of their account. And I want to do that here. Uh, you know, trade execution is important. In our, in our final session today, Roly is going to speak about trade execution, selecting strikes, select, uh, selecting expirations. Uh, so you'll certainly want to listen to that discussion for sure. But when you do execute a trade, what happens in your account? What are you going to see in your account? Uh, that's what I want to do from the long side and from the sell side. First, the, the buying example. Uh, here we have a September 90 strike call option quoted 120 bid offered at 130. And the investor buys this option at the ask price of $1.30. So what do you see in your account? First of all, the cash is debited by $130. Remember, that's 130 times 100. You will have a position go into your account long one SEP 90 call likely valued at the bid price of 120. The best price someone else is willing to buy it from you is likely where your broker may put that value at. The net between the two often results in a negative uh, account balance change of some level, $10 in this case, uh, it'd be a little more with transaction fees. Just that difference between the bid ask. And this is the same way it works with stock, but in options because the bid ask could be wider, you might see this dynamic a little more frequently. Say the stock market rallies and uh, your, 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 uh, your stock moves higher. The SEP call goes up to 350 bid offered at 370. Well, your cash hasn't changed. You're still uh, debited 130 there. That didn't change at all. But now your, your credit value of your option has changed. This is the variable amount that is moving as the stock moves. Your account balance is now up to 20. That's unrealized profits. Uh, valuing the option on its current best bid. Some more time passes, the stock sells off. You get out of this trade by selling for $3. And now it's, it's very simple. Still your cash had gone down by 130, uh, but now you're going to receive this $300 back. You have no option position and your net account balance will have increased. And now it's a realized profit. The difference between your sell price and your buy price, the net amounts there, 300 minus 130. Pretty simple. Uh, let me do this again from the sell side. It could have a tendency to be a little bit different uh, looking at things from the sell side. Most investors are used to buying stock and seeing all that in their account. They may not be used to selling first. So let's just take a look at that. Uh, the June 35 put quoted 275 bid, 285 offer. And here you have a selling one June 35 put at 275. Maybe this is a cash secure put. You're interested in buying stock at 35. It's trading a little bit above that. You sell this put option and, and willingly give yourself the obligation to buy shares at 35. 
you'll get paid right up front immediately. Your cash goes up by 275. Now your position will go in as a short option position, valued likely at the best offer, the best price that you can get to buy this thing back to close. And again, the difference between the two is likely going to end up with a slight a decrease in your overall account balance. Doesn't necessarily mean you're losing money right away. I've heard a few investors say that to me. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means that difference between the bid ask spread, your execution price versus the best price to close is likely going to be a little bit against you. Uh, so now you have three weeks later, the market for the, the, the 35 put has gone down and the stock hasn't gone anywhere, hasn't done anything. Cash hasn't changed. We're still up 275 on our cash side. The position is still a debit, but now it's a smaller debit. 165 is the debit now. And our account balance is fluctuating. We have an unrealized gain of $110. A little bit further down the line, the option expires worthless out of the money. Uh, we're fine with that. We didn't get shares, but we made some money. The cash stayed at 275. The position just disappeared and net profit was 275. Investors often think, and when I ask this question, when you sell an option and it expires worthless, when do you see that money in your account? When do you see those gains? And a lot of investors maybe give the knee-jerk answer and say, well, you see money right away. You see that gain right away in your account because you're paid up front. And while you're paid up front, that's true. You won't see your account balance uh, with that gain until the end. It's a gradual increase of unrealized gains until the option expires. And that's, uh, that's a little bit from the, the buy and the sell side. I do want to throw up uh, just a little bit of our contact info and where we're at. If you wanted to ask some questions to our investor services team, um, uh, options at the OCC.com is where they're at, former professionals, and uh, optionseducation.org is our website. And let's, get to, uh, let's get to some questions here. Um, someone's asking, you know, just simply the difference between stocks and options. You know, well, just real quickly, as I said before, um, the difference between stocks and options, first of all, starts with what flexibility do you have when you trade stocks? You can buy or you can sell. You can go bullish, you can go bearish. And many investors are not taking the short stock position. Options open up a whole lot of doors to you. Uh, so bullish, bearish, and neutral strategies. You can buy first and then close later. You can sell first and then buy back later. All sorts of different things you can do uh, with options. Now, one thing I'll just say, if you're, if you're buying call options, for example, keep in mind you are not a share owner. Uh, so you don't have those privileges of voting rights or dividend distributions. Uh, so you're, you're an option owner. You're not a shareholder until you exercise uh, the option. Uh, let's see what other questions we have. Uh, can you talk about the value of what the option contract consists of? Theta, Delta, Gamma, Vega, Rho. Sure, there's an entire presentation there with this question. Those are the, the five uh, common Greeks, uh, Delta and Gamma, somewhat tied together. Uh, when it comes to option premium and value, uh, Let's think about the pricing models for a second. I, it'll take too long to answer this question in great detail, but I'll just say pricing models have inputs on one side, including the stock price and the strike price, uh, days to expiration, volatility, interest rates, dividends, and the result is the options premium or a theoretical premium amount given all of those inputs. Uh, Delta, Theta, Vega, Rho, they are all attempts to measure when you change one of those inputs and keep all of the rest uh, the same, but change one of them, what effect does that have on the option premium? If I change the strike price, or if I change the stock price, uh, if I change the days to expiration, or if I change, what does that one variable do to the value of the option? That's what those Greeks are attempting to do. I'll go back to the calculator, a great exercise in trying to absorb uh, the importance of the Greeks and, and uh, the effect they can have on an option is to go to a calculator and change those dynamics, specifically volatility. Keep in mind, volatility often does not move by one or 2%. It can move by five, 10, 15%, uh, depending on uh, market circumstances. So uh, that's the way I would define pricing with respect to those Greeks. 
and uh, and I would suggest using a calculator uh, to look at uh, to look at those a little more deeply. Uh, how how are those put premiums calculated? Uh, referring to my presentation specifically, I used a calculator. Exactly what I did: uh, selecting a hypothetical stock and uh, going back um, with with uh, uh, inputs that were realistic and uh, inputs that were observed in the open market and uh, used a calculator to come up with very realistic, realistic looking put premiums. Uh, certainly I, I do, uh, when I calculate my examples, I look for higher volatility stocks. Uh, oftentimes that will exaggerate the effect of premium, um, but uh, you know, given certain levels and certain implied volatility levels, uh, those premiums were, were drawn in some way, shape or form uh, from the open market. Uh, we have some more questions coming in. How do you know what the volatility is? Um, uh, well, that's, that is the great unknown. Uh, how do you know what volatility is? Well, you, you can back, back calculate. Let's, let's think about those pricing models again. If you input stock price, strike price, days to expiration, interest rates, you leave volatility unanswered. And instead of calculating the option price, if you observe the option price in the open market, and insert that into the formula, you can then back solve for volatility. And, uh, and I'm, I'm a broken record here with calculators, but you can use calculators to do that, to back solve for volatility, to determine what volatility is being used to price the option at this level. Um, so that's how you can calculate what volatility is. Now, as far as, as having an opinion on that, that's a different question. Uh, historic volatility looks back at what the stock has already done. That's, that's factual. That's looking back um, at previous movements in the stock. Implied volatility is what's used in options, and that's an attempt to forecast what's an appropriate level of volatility looking forward using historic as a guide, but then also looking ahead. Maybe there's earnings next week. Maybe earnings has already occurred. Maybe there's a presidential election coming up looking ahead to what volatility might be between today and expiration date. That's what implied volatility is trying to do. It changes all the time. Buyers and sellers, me, you, and everyone else entering orders into the marketplace are driving prices up and down and moving volatility levels. Uh, so for some investors, you can evaluate and form an opinion on volatility. For others, uh, they're just aware of it. They're just tracking it. If you buy an option, they're making a note. What is the implied volatility level that I just paid? Or what is the implied level that I just sold? At the very least, that'll help you understand uh, the changes in option premium moving forward. If something doesn't occur as you, ex as you would have expected, you think, wait, the stock went up. This call option is not increasing in value like I thought it would. Undoubtedly, look back at the implied level you paid and look at the implied level today. And that's the kind of uh, difference you might see uh, uh, to help explain those, those changes in option premiums. Uh, do you have to own the stock you are creating options for? Absolutely not. Uh, it, is, it is common to own stock uh, within a few popular strategies. The covered call, again, Jason's going to talk about that. The covered call involves owning stock. The protective put involves owning stock. But many investors use options because they don't want to deal with stock. They don't want to deal with buying or selling shares. So they're using options in various ways to try and make money simply off the option premium moving. Um, a, an interesting fact that maybe most investors don't realize, the vast majority of options that are opened are closed before ever reaching expiration. There is what I would say is a myth that exists uh, in this industry that most options expire worthless. And I've heard it from educators who say 70, 80% of all options that are open to, are, are expire worthless. And it's not true. Most options are, uh, are closed before ever reaching expiration. Of those that are held through expiration, the vast majority do expire worthless, which makes sense because the holder didn't have a chance to sell the option for anything. It, it lost all of its value. Uh, but that, that's a myth. Most options are, are open and then closed before ever getting to expiration. And a lot of investors are doing just that with no intention of, of, de of, of dealing with shares of stock. Uh, what are the downsides to long calls? Uh, currently buying uh, 
uh, looks like like long dated calls, uh, you know, 2022 20, and beyond. Well, well, first of all, the downside to long calls is you're, you're going to suffer from time decay. Uh, that's for shorter dated calls. You're suffering from time decay. You need the option, the stock to move in your direction within a, sh uh, a, within a certain period of time and of a certain magnitude. If you're buying longer dated calls, you're somewhat taking out that that time decay factor because time decay is so slow when you go out a few years. However, what you're also giving up by going that far out is sensitivity to the stock price. As the stock moves $1, those options that are two years out are not going to move as much as the near-term options would. They're less sensitive. So the further you go out in time, the larger you would need that stock to move to start recognizing those gains. And maybe say that a little differently, if you buy an option that goes out two years and then all of a sudden tomorrow there's a buyout rumor and the stock is up 50%, you're gonna wish you bought near-term options because that near-term option is gonna move uh, much more quickly and, and be much more sensitive to that, that near-term stock price movement than the long-term option uh, would. Uh, last question I'll take here. Uh, can you explain the difference between open interest and volume? Uh, yes, certainly uh, all options that get listed start out with an open interest of zero. Uh, they're all that way. Volume is how many contracts are traded on a given day uh, as uh, we'll say opening transactions when the buyer is opening a position and when the seller is opening a position, uh, open interest goes up. And when you have two closing transactions, open interest goes down. So with a new contract, the buyers and sellers are both opening, open interest is going higher and higher. Uh, now in the, in, in the meantime, if there's, if there's opening versus closing transactions, um, that's volume, that's trades, but open interest isn't changing. Open interest instead represents the, the number of open contracts, or you might look at it as the open uh, assignable contracts that exist in, in the options market. So a little difference there between uh, open interest and uh, volume. Uh, lots of questions still rolling in. I, I, will, uh, I will get to those and answer those um, by text and see uh, if we can get you good answers there. Uh, but uh, for this first session, and again with our, with our reference on the board for OIC, I will close up the first session and looking forward to, uh, to hearing about Tony in session two.